Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. Let's get to it. Anthony for three. Superior. The Yankees are just fucking superior to all. Every single one of you peasants and your stupid small market franchises. That's the mood I'm in. I'm in Yankees asshole mode again, man. Every win this team picks up in the playoffs is going to fuel that Yankee arrogance inside of me. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to episode 724 of the podcast. The Yankees win yet another game in the postseason. This time, 5-2 to two in Game 1 of the American League Championship. Whew. Um, so that makes three more to go, folks. You know, we're doing this round by round. Three more to go until the... Uni- <laughs> wow, I can't even say it. It's been so long. Three more wins to go. The Yankees just need to go 3-3. Three and three. Three more wins, and your New York Yankees will be in the World Series. There you go. Finally got it out. I would like for them to be better than 3-3. Three and three. Let's just get this thing done now. Um, but they took the, the, the first game, which was a huge game to take, because this was the Carlos Rodon game. This was the game that Cleveland was supposed to take before they head back home. But the Yankees stole it. I don't want to say steal it, but they took it. And it's a huge win because now the Yankees are going into Game 2 up one nothing, with their ace on the mound at home. Garrett Cole, who's been dominated against Cleveland in his career, 4-0 in the playoffs, I think with a 1.98 ERA, gets to face them one last time. Hopefully one last time. I would love to sweep this team. Um, I don't know, man. I just feel the confidence right now. I'm feeling it. Like this Cleveland team, yes, they're they're a team that you should respect a lot more than Kansas City, or if it happened to be Detroit, they're better than those teams, maybe. But like they 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 looked sloppy last night. Um, on paper, they look overmatched. It, it just doesn't like their formula, and this isn't. I'm not knocking Steven Vogt, but this is more, I guess, the way the roster has been built. That's not a formula that is sustainable in a seven-game series. The way that they're going about this, and if they're going to go about this the way they did last night, or they just go straight-up bullpen games. Now, I know they're going to have Tanner Bybee pitch tonight. But outside of him, like that rotation is not strong. And they do have an elite bullpen. But if you're going to consistently throw out five, six, whatever, however many relievers they threw out there last night, you're going to see, as you saw yesterday, one of them at least is bound to be off because that's just how math works. I just don't think that's a sustainable formula. In a seven-game series against a Yankees team with a lot of depth, that's their strength this year. I don't know if Cleveland is going to be able to do what they did last night and expect to win games. They're going to need Jose Ramirez, knock on wood. But they're going to need need their starting rotation to give them some length. And I think today, this, this might be the series. If the Yankees take this game, I don't think Cleveland has a single shot. 
Um, if Cleveland finds a way to spoil this, they're they're going to go back home satisfied, one to one. So the Yankees have to. I, th- th- this would be a huge win for the Yankees to sweep at home before you go out on the on the road for three straight in Cleveland. Um, but it was a big win last night for the Yanks. You had the lefty Rodon going up against the righty veteran Cobb. Bottom three, you get the Juan Soto home run, and then the Yankees score on two wild pitches after that to make it 3 nothing. Cobb comes out of the game after, I think, two and two-thirds. Cantillo, this young lefty Cantillo, comes in to replace Cobb. And this poor bastard, him and, him and Bo Naylor just having a tough time getting on the same page, Um, you know, with runners on first and second and two outs, Rizzo steps up to the plate. Cantillo throws two sliders in the dirt, and then he gives him a wild four-seam fastball, which scores Aaron Judge. And then he throws a slider in the dirt to walk Rizzo and load the bases for Verdugo. And on a one-two count, he throws another wild pitch, four-seam fastball that gets behind to the backstop, and that scores Giancarlo. <laughs> and they, they had, I think, four or five wild pitches slash pass balls on the night, did Cleveland. Uh, bottom four, you got the Aaron Judge sack fly to make it 4 Uh Cleveland's only run, or they scored two. Their first run came at the top of the six with the Rokio home run off Rodon to make it 4-1. to one. Bottom seven, Stanton responds with a home run himself. To make it 5-1 Yankees. It was a moonshot. He continues his dominance in the postseason. Top of the eighth. Stephen Kwan with a base hit makes it 5-2. But that'd be all for Cleveland. The Yankee arms. Nine innings. Two runs. Six hits. It was Rodon to Clay Holmes. To Tim Hill. To Luke Weaver. Uh, Cleveland went Cobb to Cantillo. To Avila. To Sabrowski. To Walters. And the Yankee bats were able to manage five runs off of them. On six hits, two home runs, seven walks. Um, you got your usual performances from Soto and Stanton this postseason in this game. Uh, Rizzo had a nice night in his return. Uh, Verdugo with a nice rebound game after a rough uh, divisional round. He was on base, I believe, three times. Uh, Aaron Judge, some more progress at the plate, I guess, which we'll get into maybe later. Um but some really key plays in the center field with Rodon on the mound. He was making some really good rangy outs. Um, Jazz played some good third base. The bat's not there. Uh, Cabrera, something to note, replaced Rizzo at first late in the game. Uh, after the game, Boone made a very interesting, as soft as you could <laughs> be, comment. Just saying he wanted to get Rizzo out of there because he was physically and mentally drained. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's the most Aaron Boone thing in the world, so I guess I shouldn't be shocked at a comment like that. Um, but, yeah, whatever that means. Hopefully he's back in there today because, uh, I mean, he, his defense wasn't great last night, but you're going to need the first base experience. You're going to need the leadership, I guess. Um, but, if you know, if you saw Cabrera or Birdie in there, I wouldn't be too upset because they were doing a nice job in the divisional round. Uh, but that was it. The Yankees win 5-2. to two. Um yeah, this was a, another game where the Yankee bats weren't amazing, but they're winning behind their pitching right now, and we're going to get to Rodon in a second. But the bullpen formula has been very effective, right? And it seems like Aaron Boone has narrowed it down to just a couple of guys that he's going to continue to go to You know, with, with a lot of these off days in between and during the series. You know, he's not using everybody. He's finding his key guys, and he's sticking with them. For the most part, it's been Holmes and Weaver, and then a lot of Tommy Canely. But in this game, you know, it was Holmes, Weaver, uh, Tim Hill in between, which we'll talk about. But but Weaver has been amazing, man. Like, uh, everybody, ha- ha- you know, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, another impeccable performance from him. I think he goes an inning and two-thirds in this game. Doesn't allow a run. Strikes out four more batters. Walks one. Um, you know, Top of the eighth inning. He comes into the game with the heart of the order due up. 
with runners on the corners, one out, and it's a three-run game. Uh, but he gets two easy outs. He strikes out Will Brennan, going four-seam, change-up, change-up. And then he gets Jose Ramirez to ground out, throwing a change-up, fading away. Top of the ninth, he comes back out there, and he looks very shaky to start. But he found it, right? He, he issues the leadoff walk to Lane Thomas on five pitches, where you could argue all five of those were balls. He got a friendly call there by home plate umpire. But then he strikes out Naylor on three pitches, going change up, four seam, change up for the swing and miss. Then Schneeman takes the plate. He strikes him out, going two change ups in a four seamer to put him behind 3 0 in the count. But then he attacks four seam, change up, change up, four seam to get a foul tip for strike three. And then he strikes out the side and finishes the game off when he gets Hedges to go down swinging. He goes three four-seamers to go ahead 0-2 in the count. And then he goes change up low in the zone. I think it was below the zone to get him to swing and miss. The Yankees win. So Luke Weaver continues to be absolutely impeccable. I mean, damn near perfect. Just doing an elite, an elite job of elevating the fastball and fading the change up away. That's been his formula, and it's worked to perfection. He's got a lot more vertical separation on his fastball this year. The velo on it is also playing up as he comes out of the bullpen. And, and you know, to, to use that changeup to be able to get left-handed hitters out, it, it just makes him that much more valuable because you don't have to play the matchup game as a righty arm. He's just been so impressive. Consistently coming in and facing the heart of the lineup in these tough spots, and going multiple innings consistently. It's just been really, really impressive. That's the only word I can find to describe it. It's been super friggin' impressive from Luke Weaver. Um, and yeah, you got Clay Holmes who came in before him. He finishes with an inning, no runs, no base runners, and a strikeout. Doing his usual thing. You know, top of the seventh. He, he's, he's been so good, too, in this playoff. He's been so good a after being demoted from closer. Top of the seventh, he gets a, a great strikeout on the pinch hitter, Manzardo, for the third out of the inning. I like the fact that in this at-bat, he mixed in every one of his pitches. He went sinker, slider, sinker, four-seam, four-seam, slider, four-seam, slider. So it was nice to see him mix in the four-seam fastball again, again, uh, that's something we discussed in the last episode about I'd like to see him go to that more, especially in games where he doesn't have his pinpoint control because that's not a pitch that moves. Um, but yeah, he, he strikes out Manzardo with the slider. It was a really good slider on Manzardo uh, on his back foot to get him swinging and missing. So he continues his postseason brilliance, getting ground balls, the occasional swing and miss. He's throwing strikes and he's working quickly and he's found himself a role in that lane that Aaron Boone uses him in. And speaking of lanes, um, the interesting decision, this was probably the most, maybe the most controversial decision. I don't say controversial, but maybe the worst decision so far of Boone's postseason. Because I think most of us were a little confused at it. Uh, going with Tim Hill there, you know, in, in that eighth inning. Why was that his lane? I, I think a lot of us were a little confused there. Um, you know, most of us, I think, were expecting Tommy Canely to come in there. Now, maybe the Yankees, I'm thinking they were just trying to save him for the rest of the series because Cleveland does have their fair share of lefties, and Tommy Canely throws that change up. Um, maybe he just doesn't want to show his hand too much. Again, we mentioned the formula. They've been going a lot of, going to a lot of uh, Holmes, Weaver, Canely. Um, you know, maybe Canely's beat up. I don't know. I didn't listen to the post game last night, but. You know, it was a three-run game, so it wasn't super tight. So maybe they were just trying to steal outs with somebody else. Um, but I didn't know that Tim Hill was that high in the pecking order. You know, I, I was... You know, they didn't use Jay Cousins much last series. Uh, they didn't use Ian Hamilton that much more. So I was hoping to see one of them. Um, but regardless, I know Tim Hill gave up the run there, but Rizzo does have to make that play at first base. That's a play that... In the past, Rizzo makes, but he has taken a step back defensively this year. Um, and then you had that moment with the um, interference after that, right? So Tim Hill hasn't been 
helped by his defense this series. Game one of the DS, you had the Volpe play, and now last night you get the Rizzo play. But, you know, maybe he's, I don't know. I always thought the other shoe was bound to drop with Tim Hill just because how how long can you go with a guy who throws 88-mile-an-hour two-seamers? Um, but, yeah, I, I, I don't want to complain too much. They won the game. He got away with it. Um, but, yeah, that's the Yankee bullpen formula right now. It's it's a lot of homes in Weaver, and it's been working. So I thought they were great. The bullpen continues to be dominant. That was their first earned run of the postseason since, was it game one? Or was that their first? I think that might have been their first earned run, period. They allowed one inherited run in game one. But continue to be brilliant. Um, and Rodon was, was obviously excellent. Um, he's, man, I was so happy to see this from Carlos, man. I, I've been a big fan of him for a while now, and I wanted to see him bounce back, and he did exactly that. He won six innings, one run, three hits, no walks, nine strikeouts, just the one solo home run, and he picks up the win. An epic bounce back start, um, a $162 million start, right? I don't care about the regular season because Carlos Rodon was brought here to pitch in the postseason. And he had himself a solid regular season. He ate innings, he racked up strikeouts, he was there every turn through the rotation. But he was signed so he could go out there and put together performances like this. And I thought he bounced back exceptionally well last night. Smart, smart pitching. You know, he talked about in his pregame interview how he wanted to work on keeping his composure this time. Because last time out, Obviously, Carlos Rodon was a little too amped up, but he kept the adrenaline the adrenaline level more tame. And he said he he watched a little bit of film on Garrett Cole on how Cole responds after getting out of innings in the postseason, and he was much more tamer. So Rodon wanted to do that, and you saw it. He was uh, there was no extra energy last night, which you know I like that from him. But you do want to bottle that up sometimes and and keep it because. You could argue that's what took him out of his, his rhythm in, in game, uh, was it game two of the Royal Series? So, you know, he didn't dial it up to 98 until later in the game. You know, in his first start, when he had that implosion, he averaged 97 on the fastball, which was his highest of the season. Last night, he averaged 95.8. So, he was just easing his way there. He didn't start dialing it up until the end of the night when he knew he was going to be pulled um and you know it it just I I think he did a much better job keeping that composure you know he didn't let one mistake lead to an implosion you know so I thought Rodon was brilliant he threw 96 uh, 93 pitches last night 54 four uh 52 four seamer 25 slider uh nine change up four curve three cutter um the four seam fastball was great it had great command in the zone last night he was elevating it, um, you know, top of the sixth inning. He does allow the 2-2 fastball that caught too much of the plate to leave the yard, right? That's when Rokio hits the home run to left field. But, again, he didn't fold this time. He did not let it bother him. He bounced back right away, and he ends the night, you know, going 97-98 a couple times to Jose Ramirez to get him to line out to Judge. Judge made a nice play there. Um, but I thought the four seam was really good in setting up his off-speed Uh, specifically setting up the slider, um, which was incredible last night. He had the wipeout slider working. It had a lot of late break to it. He was using it on both sides of the plate to lefties, to righties, some back foot sliders, a ton of great front door sliders. You know, top of the second, it's a scoreless game at the time. You got a man on first base, two outs. He gets Jimenez to strike out swing, and he goes two fastballs at different eye levels, goes downstairs, upstairs, and then he goes slider low and out. Top of the fourth inning, he picks up two more strikeouts with the slider. Going with a back foot slider to the righty lean Thomas to strike him out, swinging. And then going with a front door slider to the lefty Josh Naylor to get him swinging strike three. So that was his key pitch last night. It got him out of a lot of, not jams, but situations where it could have gotten worse. Um, I, I thought the, the, the changeup was very good. It got a ton of swing and miss. Obviously, using that against right-handed hitters, um, 
the curveball, you know, not a ton of usage on the curb, but it had good shape and good break to it. And then the cutter. He's been flashing that a little bit more in his last few starts. Even his last regular season start, he showed a little bit more. Um, in the Royal Series, he used it a couple times. And in this in this start, he went back to the cutter, used it a few times. Uh, um, I think he threw it going away to Stephen Kwan. You know, uh, he got a foul tip strike in one of those at-bats to Stephen Kwan. Uh, he recorded in in-play out using the cutter to Kwan in his third at-bat, I think it was. So... The cutter is something that he kind of ditched for most of the season, but he's bringing it back a little bit more here and there, uh, and it's gotten him some outs. Uh, but this was a super impressive outing from Carlos Rodon. You know, Cleveland is a lineup that's been very good against left-handed pitching this year, so you were a little bit worried about that. But Rodon kept the ball out of the zone, especially with his off-speed and breaking, um, and he got 25 swing and misses. Um that's the most in a Yankees playoff start since 2008, which was when they first started tracking with. So very, very happy to see Rodon rebound like this. Um, he's going to be key because to have two aces like that, that's going to be a hard rotation to hit. Um, so, yeah, shout out to Carlos Rodon for really bouncing back. We're going to head to break. When we return from break, we'll talk a little bit about this lineup. Um, and we'll start with Aaron Judge. So stay with us. Be right back. Hey there. Thanks for listening in so far. If you enjoy this episode, please give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks so much. You can follow us on social media as well. On Instagram, we're at BD4Pod and at Rob J. Carbone. On X, we're at BD4Pod and at RJCBD4. And on Facebook, we're BD4. If you're interested in our website, just go to www.bd4blog.com. You can subscribe to our blog on there right on the front page. Just like on the podcast, we cover Yankees, Knicks, and MMA. Also on our website are the links to the different platforms for the podcast. Thanks so much. All right, so uh, before we continue, I just saw uh, Talking Yanks posted it on their Instagram. Juan Soto's a Gold Glove finalist. <laughs> Definitely didn't feel like that was coming. Um, Volpe and Verdugo also finalists, uh, but the Soto one threw me off. I, I didn't feel like he was very good at all in right field. Um, hmm. I don't think the metrics were great either, but I got to double check. Um, all right, Aaron Judge. Um, yeah, let me see. What did he go? One for, no, I don't think he had a hit, but he got on base once. And he, yeah, he had walked and he had a sack fly. So, listen, he gets his first extra base hit in game five of the LDS. He has his first RBI last night. The on base percentage has been there. Um, the hard contact has been there the last couple of nights. He's been a victim of some tough calls, right? His first at bat last night, you had that 1 1 splitter that was called a strike. Then Cobb dots that two-seamer low and out that was called a strike three. And they have been pitching around him like that. You know, uh, Cobb and even uh, Cantillo last night really wanted no part of him, so it's hard to... That's that's what you can hang your hat on, I guess, right? There are some signs there. I still think Aaron Judge needs to hit. I, I, I know that he's been better and he's not been as abysmal, but he's batting what a buck thirty-five. I still need more slug. I still need him to get that first big hit. I still need him to hit that first home run. The Yankees are. They were zero for seven last night, despite the five runs. They were still zero for seven, with runners in scoring position, which means overall this postseason across six games now, they're six for forty-two. That's a buck forty-three, and a big reason for that 
has been Aaron Judge. How many times so far this playoff has Judge come up with Torres and Soto on base with nobody out? Again last night, you got two on, no outs in the first inning for Aaron Judge, and you don't get a single run out of it. They cannot keep doing that. That is not a tenable formula. You know, um, yes, he, he has been great in center field, but man, he has got to start mashing. So maybe it's a sign of things to come that he's been better the last couple of games, but I still need results to be much better than what they've been. Aaron Judge not hitting is going to come back to bite that. Maybe you can get away with it in this series, but I don't know. I have a little bit more respect for the Guardians than I do KC, especially with their bullpen. I The Yankees, if they want to make a run here, I just don't see how you can get away with it without Aaron Judge being Aaron Judge. This team goes where he goes, no matter what you do. Your best player is always going to be your, need to be your best player. Um, so I, I know he's struggled with off-speed. You know, low splitters in the zone, change-ups. Uh, you know, they were busting him in with some cutters in, in those Reagans games. But it's got to be better from Aaron Judge. So, right now, he's getting carried by Soto and Stanton, who've been just phenomenal, sensational. Soto last night was 2-for-3. RBI walk, and he hit his first Yankees postseason home run. Um, with Stanton turning into Ruth, Soto's quietly having himself a hell of a postseason. Quietly. Batting 353 with a 1043 OPS, three RBIs, four walks, two extra base hits. Uh, but Giancarlo Stanton's been so amazing, nobody's talking about that. Stanton was one for three last night with a homer, walk, RBI. He's now batting 368 this postseason. With a 1244 OPS, five RBIs, three walks, and four extra base hits. He's been so phenomenal in that number five spot. I almost don't want to move him off, but at the same time, Austin Wells has been so abysmal at the cleanup spot, you might have to shake up that batting order. You know, do you move Wells off cleanup? His numbers have been awful this playoff. You know, the OPS, I think, is 200, which is, I didn't think that was possible. Um, his at-bats have just been very quick, very bad. It's been some pretty soft contact, too, so it's not like he's getting unlucky. And if you remember, you know, he didn't hit in September either. I'm wondering if it's the wrist that's bothering him, because he did hurt the wrist in that Texas series. He's been struggling against high velocity. I don't know, but whatever it is, I don't know if you can have him back clean up anymore because it's just not a tenable formula either, especially with Judge struggling. You know, you could Judge at three not coming through right now consistently, and then you got Wells not doing a damn thing. That's a tough three four to go through. You know, it's wasting those Soto and in 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 Torres uh, at bats, completely wasting them. They're getting on base for nothing because your next two batters are not doing squat. It's a weird term to use. Um, and I know you don't want to stack righties three and four. You know, you want to be able to alter oppose, opposing managers' decisions and you want to be able to make it tougher to match up with, but, like, you might have to because he's been that bad. And Jazz Chisholm behind, was he, he six? Behind Stanton has not been good either. So maybe you move him down as well. Maybe you shake it up a little bit in that bottom half. I, I think what I would do is live with the stacking righties. You have to go Judge 3, Stanton 4, but then maybe you move Rizzo up to 5 because he looked fine last night. And you know, if, 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 if At worst, Jesus, at worst, you just want Rizzo to take pitches. Take pitches, crowd the plate, try to get hit, do his thing. And then maybe you slide Volpe up to 6, which means you got from 3 to 6, right, right, left, right. You know, Volpe's been hitting the ball hard. He has been getting on base. He's working at bats. I liked what I've seen from Volpe. Jazz goes to seven. Do you try Dominguez? You put him eight just to split up the two lefties because you have Wells at nine now, I would do. So that's that's Judge righty, Stanton righty, Rizzo lefty, Volpe righty, Jazz lefty, Dominguez switch, Wells lefty. 
you know, you could still alternate pretty much doing that. Um, but if it's Verdugo, then you're, you're, you're putting three lefties down at the bottom of the order. So it's going to be hard. You know, that's why the Yankees aren't, I'm thinking, you know, cause they're very matchup, uh, dependent. They love their matchups. That's probably why you're not seeing Wells lower in the order, just simply because he's a lefty. Um, and the Yankees are winning at the end of the day. They are, they've won four out of their five postseason games. So, you know, that's, I'm sure, a factor. But, you know, the lineup hasn't exactly taken off yet. And it's been because you're not getting production from three and four, the two most important spots in the order, arguably. Like, that needs to be productive. You know, and you're, you're only two games this postseason where you scored five-plus runs. You know, you, you got some help with the umpire in game one. You know, you had the Jazz stolen base that was called a stolen base. And that led to a couple more runs. And then last night, you get some help from Cantillo on those two wild pitches. So you, you got to think about a lineup change. Um, you know, I would like to see Dominguez in there because I think there's just way too much upside in that switch hitting bat with power. I can see him getting some big hits. Uh, but Verdugo did, again, have a bounce back night last night. So I don't know. Something's got to change in that lineup. It's got to be Wells moving down. I just, I, I think it's a big problem. This all goes away if Aaron Judge hits, right? <laughs> that's that's also true. Um, but I think we'll wrap it up here. I don't think I want to go too long. I do have to head to work, so I want to keep this at, uh, I want to I get this up in time before game two tonight. So that's it. The Yankees take game one behind Carlos Rodon. We're going to get to our trivia question as soon as we return from break here. Stay with us. We'll be back in a minute. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. Thanks for listening to BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA, Yanks every series, Knicks every game, and MMA on occasion. Okay, welcome back to the podcast. Episode 724, the Yanks take game one behind Rodon. ALCS game one, 5-2 to two in the Yankees' favor over the Cleveland Guardians. Um, great win. Excellent win. Tanner Bybee tonight. Let's hit that guy. Let's have Cole put a shutdown performance. Um, but before we do wrap this up, let's, let's, uh, let's get to our trivia question of the day. Okay, in this episode, our trivia question is, what year was it the last time the Yankees won game one of the ALCS at home? All right, what year was it the last time the Yankees won game one of the ALCS at home? So let me know the answer wherever you can reach me. If you get the answer correct, I'll give you a shout out in the next episode. You can DM me the answer. You can comment the answer on one of these platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, um, wherever you can reach me. If you get it correct, I'll give you a shout-out in front of all two of our listeners. But, folks, that's it for this one. I appreciate you all tuning in. Episode 724 is in the books. Thanks for listening to BD4, and I will see you after Game 2, which is hopefully a Yankees victory where we can say they swept at home and... Um, set themselves up very well going into Cleveland. So let's hope that's the storyline for tonight's game, after tonight's game. And I'll see you in 25, or 725. Later. Thank you all. I'll see you then. This episode was brought to you by Anchor. Hey there! 
If you stayed the entire way through, we thank you immensely for it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you come back for the next episode real soon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, download these episodes, and share them with your friends as well. BD4 is a five-star podcast simply because of you, and we'd like to keep it that way. Have a wonderful day. Go Yankees and go Knicks.